At some point, we all face really confusing situations. And because of our experiences so far, we can't see what's really going on. Then all of a sudden, there is an encounter. Something crazy only God could explain. We have a light bulb moment, and we can finally see things clearly. These insights can significantly change our life direction. What if you could learn from somebody else's light bulb moment? My insight could be your insight. Significant life, God-inspired moments that can change a life. Hey, great to have you here. And as you share this, uh, the Horton Fano Monica mentioned to me a couple of weeks ago about speaking and, and about a significant moment or a light bulb bulb moment that Sue and I have had over the years, and perhaps, in a sense, how that has affected our, um, our family, members of our family. So um, tonight we have my daughter and my son, who's going to come and uh, tell you the truth of how it impacted them and, and how they ended up, how they ended up. So, uh, so it should be some fun. So I guess, for me, the real significant light bulb moment over our lives uh, as we had this journey with God is a few times in our life we've come across this question, what is God saying to you? And uh, to me it's a really fair question because if you're a follower of Jesus, you believe in a God who is alive, who is real, who is tangible, who is practical, who you talk to in prayer, who you communicate with, a God who is seeing and hearing and that we totally believe in. And uh, we get to that point in saying, what is God saying to me? What is God in my life? Because the alternative is I pick up God when I come to church and when I go home, I drop him off and leave him there until the following week. Then I pick up God again and I go to church and then drop him off on Sunday. And the other six and a half days of the week, God kind of lives out here somewhere. But this question is so real because God is so real to us. In Genesis chapter 2, it said God's at work. God created the, the world that we live in over six days. Then he had a rest. And then Genesis chapter 1, it says the Spirit of God is hovering over creation, over the, over the waters. God is so alive and practical, so we have to ask ourselves, what is God saying to me? What is this really about, my faith and my belief? You see that, that God loves us so passionately. He cares for us so much. And I guess you can say, well, we hear that every week. You do hear it because it's real. It's true. And we all have to hear completely and totally that God loves us and he's been speaking to all of his people through the generations. You look at the Old Testament, the people and the prophets. God talks to Jonah. He, he, Jonah runs off in the other direction. A fish swallows him up. God allows the devil to taunt Job. And it's not so great, but Job, no, Job knows that he can cope with the challenge. And then God tells Noah that a huge flood is coming. You better build a boat. God is talking. Jonah eventually, he listens to God, and he goes to Nineveh. Job eventually comes through it all, and he doesn't curse God and die like his wife does. But there's a good news story at the end of Job. And as we know, Noah, Noah builds an ark, and the family saved. Matthew chapter 1, speaking about the birth of Jesus, it says, we will call him Emmanuel, God with us. God with us, alive today. In Acts chapter 10, Jesus rose from the dead and says he was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. You see, God is passionately alive and willing and wanting to be in every aspect of our life, from birth to death. So the question remains, well, it doesn't go there. Oh, yeah, that's all right. We won't go there. You see, it's kind of easy to get stuck in a few concepts of the Bible or Christian experience. You know, and we, we don't allow our faith to grow and mature. I remember years ago when I was working in the Air Force, I, I got commissioned. I was quite young in my early 20s. And then all of a sudden, I've got a staff of 85 old senior servicemen who work for me. And I have to tell them what to do. And when you're 21 and they're 45 and they're hardened servicemen, 
they ain't going to listen to me. And it was really hard going. And then someone, a senior person said to me one day, he said, you know, those people are really experienced. But he said, they have had one year's experience 20 times. One year's experience 20 times. And they're very good in their one particular area of proficiency and work, which is great. But they've had one year's experience 20 times. And when I understood that, it all started making sense to me because, you know, that's, that's what can happen in, in our Christian life. We can have an experience or two experiences, and we can kind of say, wow, that was so great. And then we wake up 20 years' time, and we're saying, wow, that was so great way back then. And God appeared to me. But what's happened in the 20 years? Have we allowed God to, to challenge us with that question? What is God saying to me? What does my Christian walk look like? Or am I just in a comfortable Christianity, a safety net, a get out of jail card that God has given me? And I stop asking the question, what is God saying to me? I did a bit of a, a count up with Sue, and uh, probably over the last 34 years, there's been six significant times when the light bulb moment has come on for us where we've had to just sit down and say, what is God saying to us? And at times it's meant, it's meant us uh, giving up, meant me giving up a secure job with nowhere to go, no job to go to. It's meant selling up. It's meant moving house. We've moved something like 14 times. It's meant relocating, meeting uh, new people, getting on with it. It's meant going to Baptist college and, and finding that you're not that academic after all. And getting through Baptist college. And when you go to Baptist college, there's actually no guarantee you'll get a job at the end of it. You can do three years and, and the Baptist system, it's all on a core process. You can study for three years and pass really well and actually not get a job. And that's the challenge and, and that's, that's what, what you do. So, you, you know, it's meant all those uncertainties. And, uh, but you, ask, uh, you answer the question, what is God saying to me? He's not going to give us the whole 20 or 30 year plan. He's going to take us one step at a time. The, uh, when we went to college 23 years ago, uh, we were working at a Christian camp out West Auckland, and uh, our pastor knocked on the door and said, what is God saying to you? And we, had, we hardly even saw our pastor. And I said, because I'd been in the Air Force, I'd become a Christian in the Air Force, I said, one day I might be a chaplain in the Air Force. And uh, he said, well, don't go next year because it's not so great. Go the following year. Twelve months passed. We never saw him. We never heard from him. We had a house down in Tauranga, so Sue and I have a catering background. Sue and I said, let's, uh, let's move, let's relocate to Tauranga, and we'll start a business. And just at that time, that was 12 months later, this pastor knocks on our door and says, it's time to go to college. And Sue got this verse at that very time from James. Listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone there know, knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. That helped us make up our mind that we should actually go to college. And going to college, uh, doors have opened, and we've continued to ask, ask the question. But what we're really saying is, do we trust? Do we trust in God? As, I, as most of you know, we go to uh, Germany in July. And the middle of last year, I said to Sue that I think God is challenging me about my time here and, and the future. And I said, I don't really have... Um, any desire to pastor churches anywhere else in New Zealand. My only uh, thought would be to go to Steiger in Germany, which I'd had three trips over there previously. So I just went home casually one day and said, yeah, I think it's time to pray about the future. My only interest would be Steiger in Germany. Germany. And Sue said, I'll come. I said, what about the seven grandchildren? Not worried about the kids at this stage. What about the seven grandchildren? She said, oh, as long as we get home occasionally. So the process started. Three weeks ago, I said to Sue, we're going to Germany in six weeks. 
how come last year you didn't argue with me? How come you didn't say, no, I can't go, I don't want to go? We have to go. We have to leave. We have to pack up. I said, why don't you argue? Why don't you say no? And, and she said, you know, she said, there's something inside that you know. And God opens and closes doors. And, and that's exactly right. There's something instinctive that you know when you walk with God. And we're all the same. If you're a follower of Jesus, we're all the same. We all have the same Holy Spirit. We all have the same questions to answer and to look at. And she said it's instinctive. And she has that, that verse in Proverbs about trusting in the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. And lean not on your own understanding. He will guide you and lead you along those, those ways. And then Exodus chapter 3, we read about God said to Moses, Who am I? I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and they say say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Do we have confidence in those two statements? I will be with you. I am has sent me. I will be with you. I am has sent me. I will be with you. I am has sent me. You know, there's plenty of people in the Old Testament, just like us, who didn't do and go the way that God asked them to go. Jonah took off in the other direction. Moses had to choose to go. And you look at Paul in the New Testament in in the the Damascus Road. Paul had this incredible experience of God. And he was blinded. And he was taken into town. And he was there for three days. And the scales fell off and he had some food and he was baptized. And immediately he went. But do you know he had to choose to go? He could have said, hey, great, great experience, great time. Thanks for the food. I'm out of here. No one made him do it. And we are the same. No one is making us do it. So it's not about guilt. It's not about condemnation. It's not about packing up and going and moving. You know, Craig and Michaela have been here for over 20 years, and this church has transitioned and transitioned and transitioned. It's not about them packing up and moving, but it's about them understanding the question, what is God saying, with, along with the eldership of the church? What is God saying about the growth of the church and the building of the church? So it's being aware that there is a question to be asked. And how do we hear from God? How do we understand God? You know, it could be as simple as, as God saying, surrender to me. Just give up. Surrender. Give up something. Stop something. Or it could be something about support something. Help somewhere. Volunteer somewhere. What is God saying to me? Because God's word, it's never about discontent. It's never about worry or anxiety. With our moves, I don't think Sue and I have ever had huge arguments. It's the definition of a huge argument, of course. We've had little arguments and debates, but it's never been a case of, huge anxiety or worry or discontent, because that, that's not of God. Certainly it's challenge, and certainly there's difficulty, but it's knowing that we can have, have that, that peace of God when, when the decision is made. And the exciting thing is that every so often we go to this place where we say, what is God? What is God challenging you about? What is God saying to you? So at that point, I shall leave it and invite Abby up. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm kind of a little bit excited, and I know that I should be really nervous because this is my first time speaking, but I've been up on stage here a number of times now um, singing. 
So I feel like this is quite comfortable. Um, so yeah, we'll see how we go. But um, just wanted to follow on from Dad and give a bit of my side of the story. Um, and <laughs> while Mum and Dad were hearing from God, I was starting my fourth school by the age of seven. And I was getting pretty good at being the new girl. Uh, luckily, because there were still five more schools ahead of me, um, there are a few positives in um, learning the skills and the art of meeting new people. I landed a job for a dating agency um, after my studies, and I had to be a hostess at singles parties. Um, so I was helping others to learn how to mix and mingle and potentially meet their future spouse. So these are great skills to be able to pass on to other people. Um, it, was, it was actually a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed it. Um, most of the time. Oh, that was um, table for six. Yeah, so good, good. Um, after the nine schools, I went to Christchurch um, to study teaching. Um, but of course, after two years in one place, I'd kind of had enough. And so I went to Auckland and I studied event management and I met my husband, Sam. Uh, that was 15, 16 years ago. Uh, we got married, did some traveling. And I had a few jobs working for event companies before having our three boys seven years ago. Um, so Dad's light bulb moment uh, certainly had a direct impact on my life and to some extent shaped my faith. Seeing them, Mum and Dad, put their faith and trust in God helped me to know that I could trust in God. But it took a while, um, probably 35 years, to realize how to do it. Um, Hebrews chapter 11 is an amazing overview of the heroes of faith throughout the Bible. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn there now. I'm just going to read a few verses out loud. One morning I was um, just reading the Bible and this, came, this verse came to me. And I just had this real sense that this needs to be read out loud. So in my bedroom, I stood up and I just started proclaiming these, you know, things by faith. And I, yeah, it was just fun. So I'm just going to do that now. Um, <laughs> that's, yeah. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Therefore, from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead, came offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as innumerable as the grains of the sand by the seashore. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered, because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down, down after being encircled by the Israelites for seven days. And I love this part. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak, Samson, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith, faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became power in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Obviously I haven't done this before. Um, in Hebrews 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw up everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We too are called to be like these faithful people who lived by faith and believed for unbelievable things. We are to tell our stories of faith to each other. And as we run this race, we get to be cheered on by those that have gone before us, which is so encouraging. So if we are meant to be running this race with faith, with love, and with obedience, what might be holding us back from hearing what God is saying to us and then doing it? For me, it was just a lot of excuses, which really can be summed up by saying I wanted to serve my own needs myself, do my own thing, and really had never trusted my life fully to God. 
My significant moment happened one and a half years ago in the cafe here one night at worship practice. I felt God say that I needed to surrender my whole life to him, that I needed to physically get on my knees and surrender to him. So I did, and afterwards I knew that something had to change, or as in the past, nothing would really change. My life could no longer be my own. And the Bible that I had been carrying around as a comfort blanket for so many years had to become real. Um, (laughs) I used to pack my Bible, you know, wherever I went, pack it in my bag. They, oh, don't forget the Bible. (laughs) But it would just stay, (laughs) it would just come on holiday with me, and that's all it did. But it was, you know, but it was always there, and it was my comfort, you know, and I loved it. And when my grandma died, I remember, because I spoke at a funeral, just holding so tightly to my Bible because, it, you know, it just comfort, comforted me. But I really had no idea what was in it, you know. I mean, I must have after all these years of being in church, but it didn't, it wasn't alive to me like it is now. Um, so what I had to do was the only quiet time that existed in my day with three young children and a husband was 5.30 in the morning. So I committed to getting up and spending time reading the Bible and praying each morning. This continued for three months solid, and my love for God's Word and my love for Jesus Christ grew and grew, which is, ah, it was so exciting. And now, I still get up as early as I can, uh, sorry, as early as often as I can, but because I'm so hungry to read my Bible, I've actually discovered there's a lot of time in my day to spend time with God as He becomes my priority. God has used this year to change my heart and build my spirit to a place where I'm ready to be used by him. This has been my desire for as long as I can remember um, growing up as a Christian and knowing, God, use me, you know, use me, use me. But I never really fully surrendered to him. So three things I wanted to emphasize tonight that have caused a change in my life is point one, reading the Bible. Point two, filling up my spirit. This is so that we are prepared when he calls us, just like in Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. While we are waiting for the bridegroom, we must be getting filled with his spirit. Um, Just funny story, I was reading my Bible one morning, and um, God led me to this parable, and I was reading it and reading it, and I felt like it was really getting in my spirit, and I was feeding on it, but I just just did not understand what it was saying. And then um, that afternoon, I was folding the washing, as that's what we do it as mums, mostly, sometimes. And, um, and I, um, had a, I wanted to catch up on the sermons, because I hadn't um, seen them that, that Sunday. And Caleb was preaching, and he was preaching on the um, fruit of the Spirit, patience. And, you know, he started preaching, I thought, oh, yep, I know, you know, I know what patience is. Um, and then he started preaching on this exact verse that afternoon, and I, I, it was so in, it filled up in me, and then he talked about how the oil that the um, lamps were filled with represents the Holy Spirit, and we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that when, and have patience so that when the bridegroom comes to, you, to call us and use us, we are ready. Um, so yeah, so that was just really awesome, and um, and that's something that's just been growing and growing in me. Um, we we can fill our spirits up by praying over ourselves and our circumstances, praying with others, fellowshipping at church and with friends, and for me, praying in tongues in my quiet time. If this is something that you do, it's our spiritual language that we've been given here on earth to edify ourselves up and build our spirit up, so that the more we do it, the more our spirit gets filled. And I truly believe that. We're we're missing, um, you know, we just really need to get fired up in the Holy Spirit again because that's the power within us that we can um, go out and actually, you know, walk in and do these things that we just can't do on our own or without our own strength. Um, and And point three is when he calls us, he also equips us for the task. Um, I believe that God is calling me into my purpose. And like I said earlier, this has been something I've been hungry for for a long time. We cry out to God to use us, but we neglect to spend time with him or to be faithful with the small things he has already given us. For me, one of those small things was reading my Bible and spending time with him in worship and prayer. Looking back on my journey, I can see he has been equipping me, but has been waiting for my life to be fully surrendered to him and my heart to be his heart. My husband said, 
that this would be a great spot um, to put a, up my sports training montage of God equipping me over the years. So if you can just imagine, um, but even though he was joking, the thought crossed my mind that we are kind of floating around with these gifts and abilities and we are using them just not necessarily for the purpose that they were designed for. So that when we finally accept help from the cr creator, sorry, or in the movie world, the trainer, our true life purpose is revealed. God was waiting for us to be fully surrendered to him and now the training can really begin and we can start to tap into the power he has placed inside of us, which is the Holy Spirit. I recently helped organize a combined women's event here at BBC. We had over 500 women here a couple of weeks ago from 43 different Tauranga churches. The event was amazing. It was attended by local women. All of the speakers were local. The musicians were local. And we have had so many women saying God spoke to them over the weekend, um, that it was really needed in our city. Um, you know, we, we travel a lot to go to women's conferences and to hear great speakers. And we've got so many amazing gifted, talented people in our city that are doing some amazing things and, um, and you know, and people were saying, let's make this an annual event. Um, but I just wanted to share how I became involved with this. Um, last year I was praying with a friend one night and I started praying for unity of our churches in Tauranga and I don't know where this came from, but just felt it on my heart to pray. So when her friend Tessa was sharing her vision for a towering a wide women's conference, Tessa is a pastor at C3 Church in the Mount, um, our mutual friend said that I had been praying about unity and that I might be keen to be involved, which I was, and I had an amazing experience of God speaking to me throughout. There were just five women on the team, so I ended up being in charge of organizing the worship, the catering, the venue liaison, and the decor. All I can say is that there's no way I have the ability to do all of that on my own. But God took over and the result was exactly what he wanted. Um, so following the event, we were discussing how it went and the girl said that I looked like I knew what I was doing. And I realized I'd never told the team that I'd studied and had a few years experience organizing events. But God looked at our hearts and chose to bring us together to organize this event because we each shared God's heart for unity of the body of Christ then from this place, our gifts and abilities became even greater in his strength. I have come to realize that God looks at our hearts, and even though he uses us in our imperfect state, he desires that our heart and our heart is his heart, and our desires are his desires. And the only way to have our heart break for what breaks his is to spend time with him in worship and prayer. We must love him first, and we must seek his kingdom first. I used to sing that song with everything I had, you know, break my heart for what breaks your heart, everything I am for my, the kingdom's cause. And and it just wouldn't happen. <laughs> you know, I would just say, oh God, break my heart for what breaks yours and then kind of go about my day the next day. And um, and now I just, oh, my heart is breaking for so much. And it's, um, yeah, and but it's not overwhelming. It's not... Um, because we know the end plan, we know that God wins in the end, and it's amazing. But you know, we we also know that we are here to um, to serve His kingdom well on earth. Um, so, if there's something stopping you from firstly answering the question, "What is God saying to me?" and secondly, being obedient to Him and what He is asking for you, then from experience, just go right back to the start, like I did a year and a half ago. Get down on your knees and surrender your whole life to him and then be diligent in seeking after him. Because we have been called to save the lost, but how can we do this if we are only getting enough water to quench our own thirst? We remain happy in him, but we will never have enough of him to give out to others. The well inside of us is unlimited and we can keep drinking and drinking way more than enough for just ourselves if we are thirsty enough. So let's get hungry and thirsty for him and for the people of this world that he has called us to love. I feel like I just did like a um, school thing. Next, next, yeah, anyway. <laughs> I feel like I didn't really move enough. But. Mitchell, this is my brother. Um, I'm the eldest of four kids and then there's Mitchell and then our sister Jolene and Fraser. And can I just say, when dad was talking, we we moved, Dad, Mum and Dad bought a house in Tauranga, how many years ago? A number of years ago. And um, and, of, and like he said, we never ended up moving here. And the weird thing is that now we all live here, just by different circumstances, except for our youngest. <laughs> except for Fraser and Hannah, who still live in Auckland, but they'll, they'll come here at some point. 
Shout out, Um Yeah, man, I want some of what she's got. I'm, I'm, uh, hopefully I can bring uh, yeah, some vibe. Um, okay, so I'm, uh, yeah, so I've kind of um, lived my whole life um, as the son of Ross Horton. And it's been, it's been quite hard living in um, light of a, oh, and a, 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 such a good-looking man. Um, this, this came to light when we were traveling around Europe um, a few years ago, and we were traveling through Turkey, and we uh, stopped to get some dinner at a restaurant. And up till then, I didn't actually know this, but um, we were there, and then this waiter kind of went past us, and then he kind of came back, and he was like, and, and to Dad, he was like, you are such a good-looking man. And then... Um, <laughs> And I was like, and, and it was a guy, and he wasn't—he didn't seem too camp or anything, but he was, um, but I, and then, and then it was like, dad was like, oh, yeah, uh-huh, like that. And then he was like, no, really, you're really good looking. And then I was sitting across the thing, and I was like, oh, I'm his son, and so I'm, yeah, obviously a bit better looking, eh? And he was like, oh, no, 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 you are, you are okay, but this man is so good looking. And by then, dad was bright red, it was probably the only time I've seen him go red in his whole life. But it was, um, it was pretty funny. And um, yeah, so dad's light bulb moment, as he was talking about before, which kind of, um, yeah, which was like um, pretty much, you know, sent our whole family on a different course in our life. Um, for me, it could probably be summed up with one thing, and that was crying on my birthday. Because, um, so my birthday is February the 9th, and we used to move pretty much like every year. So I'd start a new school the week of my birthday. So uh, as you can imagine, I never had any friends on my birthday. So um, yeah, so that, so dad's like, well, moment, that's pretty much um, how I sum it up in my head. But no, no, but seriously, um, yeah, so tonight I just want to sort of touch on that a little bit. But um, also I want to talk a bit about um, a few sort of things I've learned in the last couple of years, probably um, quite different to what dad and Abby have talked about. Um, yeah, and I've sort of titled it The Significance of Insignificance. Um, I don't know, I thought that was catchy, but uh, I'll see if I can explain it as I go. The idea of it is sort of um, this idea that we're no less or more important than um, anyone else in the world, and also that, um, you know, we live in this, this, what Christians are called to be, like an upside-down world from the culture around us, and I think it's just so hard to... Um, you know, battle that idea of being significant, and um, and for me, yeah, I think it's been like a big part of my life. Like I grew up, I, as probably quite a few of my friends know, I I used to get really into things, and I was always a dreamer, and so I was always like dreaming about how I was going to be significant. So I um, so I've I've pretty much every four years, um, come to the Olympics, and um, the, it's funny, but it's actually, like, when, I, when it happens, it's kind of sad. Like, I actually am very delusional, but I actually decide that I, I'm going to make the next Olympics. And, like, really seriously, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start training tomorrow, and um, in four years' time, I'll be at the next Olympics. And so um, that's happened three times, actually. I think the first one was running when I was, like, 16 or something, and then I can't remember. I think cycling was 20, and then I think, kayaking was 24 and that one was extra sad because I even used to time how long it would take me to get from my house to the Olympic um, kayaking um, regatta thing so yeah so anyway so I always had a desire to be somewhat significant um, I guess uh, where this kind of idea of the significance of insignificance kind of started was um, something dad always said to me uh, growing up so we when I um, when I went off to school or anything or anywhere really dad would always say to me, be kind to people. Like, that was his, like, thing that he would always say. And he's just said it, even now, like, he always, like, you say bye, and it's like, oh, make sure you're kind to people and stuff like that. And I, I guess, like, it, it was probably a really cool little mantra that I, I wasn't really that aware of, but it kind of built up in me. And um, and um, I, I always thought it was quite funny looking back. Like, I'm sure a lot of other parents probably were like, oh, yeah, make sure you work really hard at school and get some good marks. But I never had any of that. And so I never really had any pressure either, which was quite good. Dad was always like, oh, man, if you pass school C, that's, like, amazing. So <laughs> he failed it twice. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, anyway, so on this idea of the significance of insignificance, I just want to talk about three sort of themes that um, I've kind of... Uh, been, been, that I've sort of found have sort of crept along my way um, in the last few years. And you could call them light bulb moments, but I'd sort of liken them more to like a, 
light bulb dim switch, you know, like when you turn on a light and it's super dim and then you slowly undim it, you, you turn the light up more. Um, it's, probably one, it's probably more like three of those moments that are kind of slowly getting turned up more. So, um, Okay, so the first one was uh, when my wife and I went to Bible college um, like three years ago, I think. We just went for a semester just to study some theology and um, kind of go, yeah, just go and check it out and, and see what it's about and stuff and um, just have a bit of a break from working. We were sort of late 20s and we'd worked for a while and stuff, so we thought we'd give it a break. And um, one of the cla- in one of the classes, uh, we were taught this thing called the, s- the faith stages. So it's kind of like a framework that describes how you're supposed to journey through your faith. And um, it was developed by this guy called James Fowler in like 1981 or something. And since then, it's been kind of the kind of framework for um, how we perceive our faith and stuff like that. And um, for me, it was just like totally groundbreaking understanding this because what it is is it's a six, effectively a six-stage faith thing that we're all on. We're all on this journey of faith, right? And um, the, first, the first two are kind of like a child's faith. So it's all about being told what to believe and you believe it through stories and things like that. And so that's sort of the first couple of stages of your faith that faith journey. Then as you get into your sort of teenage years and you start kind of getting more involved in your own kind of ideas and what you believe and things like that, you enter into this kind of corporate faith time and it's kind of where you go, um, you sort of start start believing what a corporate, a corporate group of people believe. So for most of us, that's a church. So, um, it's, so you start believing the same things that the church you go to um, calls you to believe in. So whether that's, you know, um, the death and resurrection of Jesus and, um, and like, yeah, all that kind of stuff, baptism, whatever, and, um, and the Bible, and we believe the Bible, things like that. And, um, that, and you know, that's a really important stage, but what, what happens is after that, we're actually meant to go on to this next stage and be, and, um, and that's a really tricky one. And that's sort of this fourth stage where, where it's about asking the questions of yourself and actually asking yourself, what do I actually believe about this? Or how, do, how does God, like, you know, how do I actually know that this is real or whatever? And, and exploring it for yourself. And I think for me it was like so groundbreaking because I, I always was a bit hard on myself because I've always been like a way too big a thinker and like not in a good way, just in like a, you know, like I'll start thinking about time and I'm like, could time exist at the same time? Could like another dimension of time be working at the same time in my house? So there's actually other people walking around, but I can only see the people at the exact time. So, yeah, so anyway, so that's sort of how I think sometimes. So for me it was like, so groundbreaking to know that this was actually not only okay to be on this journey of like asking questions and reading and finding out what I actually believe, but it was also actually a really important and necessary step in your faith journey to get to the next stage, which is the idea that you um, you actually uh, you actually understand for yourself what you believe, and um, that's kind of the idea of where I'm heading. Hence the dimmers kind of going up so yeah so that um kind of armed with this new realization that it was good for me to read more and to explore um ideas about my faith and and read different authors and things like that I um delved into a few books and one in particular kind of popped up and and it's probably been my bread and butter book for the last sort of three years and that's um Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis um, hopefully, a few of you have read it. It's such a good book. If you if you get a chance, um, definitely grab it. it C.S. Lewis um, did a series of uh, like um, radio talks during World War II to kind of like um, bring up the morale of all the English people. They were constantly getting bombed every night, and um, he kind of wrote this book that kind of it was like kind of like a bit of a handbook to Christianity a bit, and um, but written from his perspective, which as a previous atheist was really well written to like everybody. So um, yeah, Um, he's got one chapter in particular, which was about pride. And that's the one that kind of became my light bulb moment. And um, I'll just read you a little bit of that. Um, It just says here, according to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. And for me, this idea of like seeing yourself as prideful and understanding that 
behind all these sins, and especially like sins like of the flesh, where it's like you're really hard on yourself, but it's it's the surface level kind of sin, um, is a sense of pride, and it's because we're wanting to do it ourselves, and we're wanting to be in charge of our own lives, and all that kind of stuff, and um, for me, it's just been a really big thing to learn and, and to develop and to think about a lot about my own life, like, what is my reaction to this? Why am I doing that? And, and actually realizing that at, you know, the seed of most sin is, is a, um, pride, and so, yeah, and um, so I guess so, the, I've got these two light bulb moments that I've sort of had, and, and they've kind of helped shape me a bit, and, um, but what I kind of realized lately has been that it's all well and good, like, having sort of a few ideas about things and reading books and having a bit of knowledge, but um, unless you actually have an experience of God or, like, know who God is in your own life and, and actually have a real kind of um, knowledge, you know, ex- yeah, like, feel of God, I guess, in some way, um, you really don't have anything, and so... Um, Probably about six months ago, I've entered into my third light bulb moment I want to talk about, which is this idea of um, transformation via contemplation. So um, it's sort of the idea that in order for us to actually, or for for us to actually find God, we actually need to um, f- break down some of the barriers and the walls walls in our lives that are kind of preventing us from finding God, um, as I see it. Uh, one of the great Teachers of this sort of movement that I'm um, into is a guy called Richard Raw. Um, I've just sort of delved into a bit of his stuff, and he he talks a lot about the false self and the true self. And the false self is kind of the idea that we, through our upbringing, through the culture we live in, through the environment that we're part of, through our sin and everything, um, we create a false self, which is not only presented to the world, but it's presented to ourselves, and it's actually, um, so it's actually like uh, undetectable at times, and so you, it's this idea that in order to actually be able to, to respond to God as he created us, is to actually break down some of those walls and discover the true self, Um, it's kind of a bit airy-fairy, but to me it's kind of makes such sense, because it's like, God, we're, we're, we're approaching God with, with barriers of you know, stuff that we've put in our lives for years and years of hurt and pain and things like that. And it's about, um, through this whole idea of contemplation, it's about putting ourselves in a position where we're silent in front of God and um, and we actually can allow him to work on us, I guess. So, yeah, I, um, yeah, so that's kind of the third one that I've kind of um, been heading into. So, yeah, so I guess for me... Um, a lot of it can be summed up in one, chap- uh, one little chapter of the Bible that I really like and um, probably is, is probably the thing that, the chapter, the verse that really um, is speaking to me a lot these days and it is, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. And for me that's kind of, the direction that I'm wanting to head in. I'm wanting, you know, like really figure out how to transform my mind and, and I'm definitely not there. And I and um, and I think, you know, talking to Abby and some of the stuff she said, I think that's kind of where I'm wanting to head towards, like actually get to that point where I'm like, oh, cool, like this is, um, this is how, uh, you know, how my mind um, is transformed. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, okay, so um, those are all my points today. So... Uh, Thanks. And, oh, I just want to. I just want to add real quickly. Um, I guess for me, like the whole when this whole um, significant thing came out, I was sort of like, oh man, like I just and and light bulb moments and being a significant person is always. I'm always like, man, how like if you if you don't feel like you've been significant, it's sort of like almost a little bit like, oh, I don't have that. Like I'm not a sign. I haven't had my light bulb moment, and I'm not significant, and things like that. And this whole what I want to talk about was that. You actually, um, it's not, I don't, for me, it's not about, I don't think, one moment. It's just, you know, like I said, about that dimmer, and it's about, you know, themes that are popping up for me and, like, are actually driving me and going with those and, um, and, and seeing where they take you and, and not necessarily um, just thinking one day there's going to be this huge, significant moment and that will be you for the rest of your life because I think it doesn't always work like that. So, um, yeah, cool. <laughs>